Hello, my name is Steve Rifle, and I'm a independent scholar and an author and a film historian. And I'm here as a visiting research fellow of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Friends of the Libraries. So I want to thank the Friends of the Libraries for this opportunity to come and do research at the, uh, the University Libraries. In particular, I'll be focusing on the Wisconsin Center for Film and Theater Research. Uh, this talk is called Dis Desegre <coughs> Excuse me. This talk is called Desegregating Hollywood: How the Civil Rights Movement Changed Film and Television. That's the title of a forthcoming book that I'm working on and that I'm here conducting research for. So, in this talk, uh, this brief talk, I'm going to talk about how the civil rights movement impacted Hollywood, particularly in the 1960s, and how some of those uh, impacts have had lasting effects. Uh, what with the um, the current state of affairs with regard to African Americans and their status in Hollywood, we have uh, currently an unprecedented number of African American filmmakers and actors and actresses receiving Oscar nominations, and even more importantly, uh, uh, an unprecedented number of African Americans uh, actually producing shows and films, directing films in Hollywood. Um, let's begin by just recapping a little bit about the 1960s. I know you all know your history very well, but of course this is a decade of unprecedented activism and political change, uh, victories and defeats. Uh, beginning in the early 1960s, there was a student movement and uh, an African American community movement uh, that was inspired by Brown versus Board of Education, Rosa Parks, and other uh, heroes and developments of the 1950s, and people took to the streets and became vocally uh, active and protested for racial justice in a way that had not really been seen before. Uh, there were sit-ins and other protest uh, activities occurring all across the country. Uh, you had heroes in the 1960s uh, and martyrs, such as Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, uh, Medgar Evers, uh, heroes such as James Baldwin and even Muhammad Ali. Uh, you had, of course, the villains of the decade, people like uh, Bull Connor and George Wallace. These are all people who helped to shape and define the decade uh, as we remember it. Uh, there was violence, unprecedented violence by the white majority uh, directed in reaction to uh, these calls for racial justice at the African-American community and their supporters. This is a Freedom Riders bus that had been attacked sometime in the early 60s. And of course there was uh, the political and legislative triumph of uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which President Johnson can be seen signing here, and of course the, uh, the Voting Rights Act, which strengthened the legislation the following year. But of course the irony is here in 2019, these rights are somewhat in jeopardy, you might argue. So what affected all of these political, legislative, and uh, activist uh, movements and activities have on Hollywood, on film, and on television? Film and television uh, and Hollywood, after all, have been the arbiter of the African-American image in this country for much of the last hundred plus years, going all the way back to The Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith, which was really the, the event, the release of that film, which gave rise to the NAACP as a prominent uh, pressure group and a protest group. Over the next couple of decades after The Birth of a Nation, the NAACP and other groups like it continued to petition and pressure Hollywood to improve the status of African Americans, both uh, on camera with respect to the, the roles they were playing, to, to, to move away from the stereotypical uh, mammies and butlers and, and into more substantial roles, and also to improve the status of American, African Americans in the industry with respect to employment. Uh, African American employment behind the camera was, for the better part of uh, the first half of the, the, the previous century and beyond, well into the 60s, that African American employment was virtually non-existent. Here are some headlines uh, from trade newspapers and other publications indicating some of these struggles. And these efforts finally... Uh, gave rise to some progress beginning in the 1950s with the arrival of Sidney Poitier, who 
was an actor of such unique talents and unique persona that he sort of was able to step in and fill uh, a role that uh, was sort of uh, predetermined. Uh, he played uh, for the better part of 15 plus years, starting in the early 50s and well into the 60s, a type of character, an African-American leading man who most often was paired with a white protagonist and this African-American character was of such virtue and of such a uh, high character that he would enable his white counterparts to have a, uh, a, a change of heart. By the end of the film, if you look at something like The Defiant Ones or Edge of the City, these are films of, uh, that Pottier made in the 1950s, uh, in those films, by the end, the white protagonist has seen the light and their racial uh, worldview, their bigotry, uh, is mitigated in some form or fashion. And this is a type of role that was well suited to the early years of the civil rights movement. And we should mention that um, Poitier was, of course, the most bankable African-American star. And when we say he was the only African-American leading man, that's, of course, an exaggeration, but not by far. His closest competition in these years was Harry Belafonte. But Harry Belafonte had other aspirations, and by the late 50s, early 60s, he had formed his own production company, and he wanted to take more control over his career and of the films being made. And so he uh, set out to, to become a producer, but of course, uh, there, it, there weren't many African-American feature film producers in Hollywood, and even someone of a stature of uh, Harry Belafonte had difficulty getting the films that he wanted to make made. In the 1960s, he really only made one film. He produced a film called The Angel Levine, which was released in 1969, and it's sort of a, a race comedy about a African-American angel, guardian angel, who comes down to Earth and uh, is the, uh, the protector, the guardian angel of a Jewish tailor played by Zero Mostel here, and the, uh, the comedy derives from the culture clash between the two. Unlike feature films, television actually was more quick to pick up on some of the social and political developments in the United States and to reflect them in primetime content. Uh, starting in the mid-60s, um, these movies or these, these uh, photographs I'm going to show you don't go in chronological order, but this is a show, NYPD, which was on NBC starting in 1967, and the uh, gentleman in the middle there is Robert Hooks. He played one of the three main characters. Robert Hooks was a very prominent stage actor in New York in the 1960s and was one of the founders of the Negro Ensemble Company, which was a very important uh, theater organization that gave rise to tons of Ameri African American talent. Uh, also around this time, you had Julia, a uh, very significant uh, show, uh, the first primetime uh, television series to star an African-American woman as the lead character uh, in a professional role. She played a nurse. And earlier in the 1960s, we had Cicely Tyson playing a secretary on East Side, West Side, uh, even though that's a secondary type of role or secondary type of occupation. Uh, it was a professional setting, a drama series, and there was nothing stereotypical, stereotypical about it. So again, a very significant development in the way African Americans, and in particular African American women, were portrayed in primetime television. Uh, extremely significant was the 1965 arrival of Bill Cosby, uh, playing one of the two main characters on I Spy, a uh, very popular show where uh, Cosby and Robert Culp played globe-traveling uh, secret agents. And, of course, Uhura, Nichelle Nichols on Star Trek, a very groundbreaking show. Also featured uh, one of the first interracial kisses on primetime television. So these are really uh, significant developments happening in television. But film was a little slower to, to pick up the pace, to recognize some of the things that were going on in our society in a, in a significant way. One of the first Hollywood mainstream studio films to pick up on the themes of the civil rights movement and to kind of translate those into a, uh, a dramatic story is In the Heat of the Night in 1967. And of course, this would win Best Picture. The film was directed by 
uh, Norman Jewison, and it was produced by the Mirish Corporation. And uh, remember those names because they figure into the archives here at the university, and I'm going to speak about that in just a second. Uh, if you've seen this film, it's a wonderful film. Poitier plays a, a different type of character to a certain extent. Uh, he's Virgil Tibbs, uh, a homicide detective from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who becomes waylaid in a small Mississippi town and helps the the racist and bigoted uh, local law enforcement authorities solve a murder case. And of course, when they first find out that he's a homicide detective, they can't even believe it. How could an African-American be a homicide detective? But of course, uh, there is the, the recurring trope of all the Hot Poitier films, and by the end of the, the movie, Rod Steiger, who he's paired up with here, uh, kind of re re relents a bit and starts to see Poitier's character not just as a black man, but as a man and as a friend. Uh, one of the things that's so significant about this film is that it has a scene in which, for the very first time, African American, uh, an African American man is shown retaliating physically against uh, white racism. Uh, in this scene you see at the bottom, uh, this, is, this moment that we're seeing here is something that's been called uh, by some critics uh, the slap heard round the world. Uh, this is a moment in which Sidney Poitier's character is speaking with uh, the wealthy, racist uh, landowner, a plantation owner who kind of oversees this town where all this activity is occurring. And the elderly gentleman is very condescending in his uh, speaking to, the, to this uh, African-American man. Uh, and at one point in the conversation, he realizes that he's being interrogated in a murder investigation, and he doesn't like it. He ends up slapping Sidney Poitier's character across the face, and Poitier's character immediately responds by slapping him back. And it was an unprecedented moment in American film history, and at the time, African Americans in the audience were said to have stood up and cheered. Now, in the, the, in the archives here, in the Wisconsin Center for Film and Theater Research, uh, among the many uh, significant filmmakers and producers and other people who've uh, donated their papers are uh, Walter Mirisch, who uh, was the head of the Mirisch Corporation, which produced In the Heat of the Night and a number of other uh, important films of the 1960s. And in these papers, we find a draft of the original screenplay written by Sir Sterling Siliphant, and it's dated in March of 1966. One of the things that I wanted to find out and one of the things that it, it's such a you know a rare opportunity to be able to come here and look through these documents, I wanted to find out if the slap heard round the world was a, in the original script for In the Heat of the Night, or is that something that was improvised and added later? Because I've heard in interviews with Sidney Poitier over the years that he would take credit for that scene. He felt that um, his character in the original script uh, it would just take the slap and turn the other cheek, and he felt that his character was not that kind of a man. He would respond in kind. So I wanted to go back to the script and find out uh, what the truth of that was. So we kind of wander through the script and we find the scene. You can see this is where Endicott and Tibbs are speaking in the greenhouse, and on the next page we see the exchange. Uh, and Tibbs asks him, he's talking about the, um, the the murder victim, has he ever been here in this greenhouse? And then um, Endicott, at that moment, realizes that he's being interrogated. It's a little bit different in the finished film, but you can see that uh, in the middle paragraph, Tibbs, I'm sorry, uh, he swings a smarting blow at the Negro, his open palm resounding on Tibbs' cheek. So that's the moment when Endicott actually slaps him, and then the next paragraph, Tibbs responds instantly, uh, slapping him back as hard or possibly harder, the blow virtually rattling Endicott's head. So this tells us that from the beginning, the filmmakers knew that they were going to have Virgil Tibbs slap Endicott back. And the reason that's, that that is significant is because it tells us how much of a risk the filmmakers knew that they were taking. So moving on, uh, in the Heat of the Night, uh, of course, one best picture. It has a lot of these themes of the civil rights movement and uh, white racism of the 1960s. You even have, like, uh, Sidney Poitier's character being chased by a, a gang of white racist thugs who are, you know, going to basically beat him to death with chains and, and sticks, and he ends up being saved at the last moment. But the popularity of that film... Uh, and the success of it at the box office led other Hollywood filmmakers to uh, want to finally make 
films about African American life that were not stereotypical and that reflected actual things going on in our country. One of the first things that uh, came up after that was actually uh, a project of Norman Jewison, the same director, uh, was a proposed adaptation of The Confessions of Nat Turner. This is a very popular Pulitzer Prize winning novel that was published in 1966-67 by William Styron, and uh, this was a fictionalized account of the slave revolt in uh, Southampton, Virginia, led by the slave and folk hero Nat Turner. And the book was very controversial, even though it was successful. Black critics assailed it because it took their folk hero, it took this folk hero, Nat Turner, and uh, portrayed him in a way that was rather unflattering. There were scenes where he lusted after white women. There were scenes where he expressed uh, homosexual uh, inclinations. And the black community was up in arms about this. And there was a major protest against this project, this film project, led by Ozzie Davis, shown here, the actor and the activist. And Ozzie Davis and um, Louise Merriweather, a novelist from Los Angeles, led this massive group of entertainment uh, industry insiders and activists against the project. And this is another piece of material found in the archives here. And this is a, a wonderful piece of history, and it enables us to go back to the source and not just rely on news accounts of the time, but actually see what the dialogue was between this protest group and the film studio and the filmmakers that they were trying to encourage not to make this film, or at the very least to change it so that it would be more historically accurate. This is a, a letter from Louise Merriweather to David Wolper, the producer, and Norman Jewison, the director of the film. And she starts off, Gentlemen, you are murdering the spirit of Nat Turner, one of the great ethnic heroes of, of uh, black Americans. You are distorting and falsifying the history of black people in this country, and by extension, defending the entire, I'm sorry, defaming the entire black race. This is an incendiary letter, and it goes on for several pages. And it's very interesting to be able to go back and re-document this history using actual materials uh, from this conversation. Also in the archives, we find a response uh, written to David Wolper from the novelist who felt that he was just under attack. This is a letter from William Styron replying to Louise Merriweather's initial letter. And he says, Dear David, the shrill hysterical charges being leveled against me by Ms. Merriweather and her associates have a disturbing echo, reminding me in their recklessness and their falsity of the charges made against Thomas Mann in the early Nazi days. So he's using very powerful imagery to uh, defend himself against these charges. And then we have other correspondence. This is a huge file of correspondence uh, going back and forth about this project, but this is an, another significant uh, development that occurred uh, in August of 1968. This is a letter from uh, to uh, Norman Jewison and the Mirish Corporation uh, about the project. Uh, and it is a an employment contract between Wolper Productions, the actual production company of the Confessions of Nat Turner project, uh, and it indicates that they chose a new screenwriter. They actually caved on a certain important demand of the protesters and hired an African-American screenwriter, Lewis Peterson. Now, eventually, this project would uh, peter out. The project was kind of notorious, and there was so much back and forth between the protest group and the producers that eventually the producers, about two years in, uh, decided to just uh, cut their losses and move on. But the success of In the Heat of the Night actually uh, inspired another, a number of other filmmakers and producers to uh, go forward with projects, not a great many, but a, a number of projects that more accurately reflected the African-American experience in the late 1960s and tried to tell stories from the African-American perspective in a way that really hadn't been done before. Another film that uh, has gone largely unappreciated or underappreciated is Uptight, directed by Jules Dassin, uh, the uh, blacklisted director. This is the first film that he made back in the United States after his blacklisting. And this film is based on a John Ford film, The Informer, about the Irish Revolution. 
And it takes place in Cleveland in the ghettos, and it's about a conflict basically within the black power movement, the black revolutionary movement, a conflict between the more extreme uh, elements of the revolution and people who wanted to stick more with the um, the tenets of the Martin Luther King uh, you know, nonviolent protest movement. Uh, one of the, the great things about this film, though, is that it in an unprecedented way, uh, employed a cast of African-American talent that really hadn't been collected on the screen all at one time before. Just in this shot alone, on the far left, you have Dick Anthony Williams, a prolific character actor of fine talent who was in so many great films uh, in the 1970s, 80s, and so on. Raymond St. Jacques is the gentleman in the foreground with the glasses, and again, uh, a prolific career, terrific actor. Janet McLaughlin, who you may know from the film Sounder, is there on the far right. And again, a prolific career. And these are people who are highly under-recognized uh, in their day. And this film collected all of them largely. And, and, and this is basically an all-black cast film. Many of the roles, in the smaller parts, were pulled from the black theater movements uh, from New York and Los Angeles at the time. So, in 1969... An unprecedented thing happened. For the first time, Hollywood studios hired African-American directors. The Learning Tree, the film that we're going to see tonight, uh, marks the first time an African-American director directed a feature film for a Hollywood studio. And it was Gordon Parks who was uh, hired to perform this task to, to, uh, to complete this milestone. Gordon Parks, of course, was uh, best known as a photographer for Life magazine. He'd been traveling all over the world, uh, photographing uh, all people of all different cultures. Uh, he did some major series on poverty in different parts of the world. He was a prolific and highly respected photographer, and he also was an author. And um, one of his earliest books is the best-selling autobi semi-autobiographical novel, *The Learning Tree*. Uh, incidentally, we saw uh, a photograph of Gordon Parks at the beginning of this presentation. Now, when Gordon Parks was given the opportunity to adapt his book uh, into a feature film by the studio, they asked him not only to direct the film, but also to produce it and to write the screenplay and to score the film. So he was quite the Renaissance man, and so the film is... Uh, it's his. This is a work of auteurism, uh, which is really unprecedented in American cinema for a first-time director. Um, the film is wonderful. Now, it's about Gordon Parks's upbringing, his childhood in Fort Scott, Kansas, and yet it it carries themes and problems and challenges that are very contemporary to the late 1960s and to uh, racism in the Deep South in the 1960s. So it, it, it alternates between this wonderful, kind of painful uh, view of childhood as an African American at the turn of the last century, and it also um, reflects things going on very much in contemporary society. Gordon Parks being a photographer, however, lends this film a stunning visual quality at times. Uh, there are beautiful landscapes, and at the beginning of the film, there's a, a tornado sequence that's just magnificent. It's done with uh, special effects and photography, and I think you're going to really enjoy the visual aspect of this film uh, in a way that you might not have expected. Now, as we said, there were a number of African-American directors hired by the Hollywood studios for the first time in the 1960s. Another of these first-time directors was Melvin Van Peebles. Now, you may know Melvin Van Peebles' name as the director of Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song uh, in 1970, and that film, of course, is the uh, the genesis of the black exploitation genre. Uh, this film is quite different. This is a studio picture that um, Melvin Van Peebles was assigned to direct based on a film that he had made in France called The Story of a Three-Day Pass, which was playing in film festivals around the world, including in the United States, and had won a number of awards. This film, The Watermelon Man, is a race comedy starring the great Godfrey Cambridge as a white businessman who wakes up one morning to find that his skin has turned black and he has to deal with race uh, and racism. And it, it's a farce. It's a wonderful film. And based on the success of Watermelon Man, 
uh, Melvin Van Peebles was offered a three-picture deal by Columbia, and he turned it down. He didn't like working within the constraints of the studio system. If you know anything about Melvin Van Peebles, he's a maverick and, and really an iconoclast. And he threw that all away, chucked it, and went out and raised uh, his own money, borrowing and begging and stealing from friends and family to make Sweet, Sweetback's Badass Song. And that film is really his legacy. Now, the third African-American director to be hired by a major Hollywood studio in 1969 was Ozzie Davis. Ozzie Davis directed Cotton Comes to Harlem, which is a, a detective story based on a novel by Chester Himes. If you've not heard of the works of Chester Himes and you're interested in African-American culture of the 1960s, I strongly encourage you to pick up one of his books, particularly this one. It's an action crime caper. And... Uh, this is a story of Coffin Ed and Gravedigger Jones, two Harlem detectives uh, played by Godfrey Cambridge and Raymond St. Jacques. It's really um, a who's who of black Hollywood in the late 1960s. features one of the earliest roles by the great Calvin Lockhart, who you may have heard of. He was a rising star at that time period and was uh, really kind of pegged to be the new Sidney Poitier, but his career kind of fell through. Uh, this is Ozzie Davis and Ruby D. Ozzie Davis was, uh, he had directed a, an independent film previously called Pearly, which was based on his, um, I'm sorry, it was titled Pearly Victorious, uh, and that was a racial comedy, a, a farce about a, a southern preacher, uh, and that was based on his play Gone Are the Days. And there were a number of other films in the late 1960s uh, that were inspired, again, by the success of In the Heat of the Night and then, of course, by things like Cotton Comes to Harlem and Watermelon Man. Uh, there were more attempts to make films about the African-American experience that were more true to life. Uh, one of them was The Lost Man. Not a very successful film, but it's interesting in that this is Sidney Poitier kind of turning on his his old image of the um, the saintly African-American man. And in this film, he attempted to... to cast himself against type by playing a black revolutionary. The film isn't terribly good, but it's interesting in what it's attempting to achieve at that time. Uh, here's a, a very interesting film by the great director William Wyler called The Liberation of L.B. Jones. And this is about uh, a small town uh, incident where uh, an undertaker's wife, played by the great and beautiful Lola Falana, uh, is seduced by a white policeman, and the scandal threatens to blow the lid off the town. Uh, it ends, again, with a controversial scene, another, another rather unprecedented view of black uh, violence, black retaliation against the white establishment and against the white uh, racist machine that has uh, oppressed the black community. Uh, there's a great scene at the end of the movie where Yafet Koto, the great Yafet Koto, basically takes one of the, the white villains and throws him into a threshing machine where he's killed. It was a controversial moment at the time. The film wasn't terribly successful. It's not a terribly good film, but it's an interesting film uh, historically for what it was trying to achieve at a time when this type of film was very, very new and very rare. Here's a film that's extremely entertaining. Uh, it's still being sort of rediscovered in, in that when it first came out, it wasn't a major hit. And now it's turning up at film festivals such as the Turner Classic Movies Festival in Hollywood. Uh, it's a very, very good film. This is The Landlord, directed by the great Hal Ashby, whom you may know for films like Harold and Maude or Being There. Uh, the Landlord is sort of a reverse integrationist film. Uh, a lot of the, the Sidney Poitier type stories where you have an African American character uh, moving about in the white world are referred to as integrationist dramas. This is a, a farcical reversal of that formula. Uh, it stars Bo Bridges, uh, brother of Jeff, and he plays the uh, rather unambitious son of a wealthy family in upstate New York and he t attempts to make a name for himself or at least to carve out his own life by buying a tenement house in Brooklyn and uh, and re he, his intent is to be part of the gentrification of the neighborhood and rehab the house into a, a multi-level flat for himself but he becomes uh, entwined and involved in the lives of, of his tenants. Uh, this is Diana Sands, the late Diana Sands, a great actress uh, who had been in the Broadway and film versions of A Raisin in the Sun several years earlier, and she's magnificent in this film. 
Uh, the film also features uh, Pearl Bailey, uh, Lou Gossett Jr., and an entire cast of African-American talent that, again, was sort of unprecedented to be seen on screen all in one film. The film uh, is essentially um, pessimistic, where a lot of the integrationist films of the Sidney Poitier variety were optimistic and kind of ended on a note of racial harmony. This film is somewhat different. And keep in mind that the book that it's based on, the novel, The Landlord, was written by an African-American woman, Kristen Hunter, and the screenplay was adapted by an African-American writer, Bill Gunn. So that's significant to know. The film essentially ends with uh, Bo Bridges' character after trying to live in the building with his African-American tenants and get along with them, he ends up leaving and going back to his life in upstate New York. There's a lot of comic interplay, culture clash between the African-American characters and the waspy whites from upstate. But ultimately, the uh, the message of the film, uh, if you if you will, is that the, the races are not meant to, to live in coexistence in the same world. Um, Here's something interesting. In the Mirish Productions files here at the Wisconsin Center for Film and Theater Research, among the papers that are held there is this memorandum that is uh, between, it's a correspondence between the Mirish Production Company and the agent for Marky Bay. Marky Bay is the uh, leading actress in The Landlord. She wasn't in the, the still that I just showed you, but she is a light-skinned African-American actress who plays the love interest of Bo Bridges. And in fact, at the end of the film, uh, they they end up together, even though they're not living in the, the tenement in Brooklyn. Uh, the idea at the end of the film is that they will go off and have a life together. Marky Bay was... Um, uh, this is her first film in, in a prominent role. She had uh, had some smaller roles, and after this film, she had a few smaller roles. But this memorandum is about her future. This is a, a, a an agreement to lock her into a three picture deal following the landlord. And although you can't see the the rest of the memorandum, you can see that she uh, will with each successive picture, she's to obtain a, a higher salary. Whatever happened to Marky Bay? Well, she really didn't do much after this. She was in a film called uh, Sugar Hill, which was made for American International, which is like a voodoo vampire African-American exploitation film. She did some television work, but by and large, she was not really heard from again in a major way. And it just goes to show you that even though there was interest on the part of some producers to uh, nurture and bring about uh, black talent to the fore, uh, there really wasn't, even in this time, a lot of room for major stars, a lot of room at the top for multiple uh, uh, leading men and women of color. So, in 1971, Gordon Parks, who, as we said, is the director of tonight's feature, The Learning Tree, he came out with his biggest hit, the biggest hit of his career, which was Shaft. This is a legendary film that I'm sure you've heard of if you've not seen, and it redefined uh, black masculinity. It redefined the black uh, leading man image for a generation on film. Now, I, I know a lot of the black exploitation films have become uh, known as cliches and known for a lot of their repeating tropes, and uh, they've uh, earned a sort of comedic quality. They've been parodied m multiple times. But at the time they came out, they were quite significant. This was a game-changer kind of film. Uh, it, you know, it, it builds upon the things that we were talking about, the Virgil Tibbs in, in The Heat of the Night, and the other black characters who retaliated against their white oppressors. And in this case, uh, John Shaft is, you know, he takes no, no bull from nobody. He was a new kind of African-American hero that really changed the way African-American men were perceived on film. This film, uh, again, was a box office phenomenon, and it went on to kind of change things for African-American leading men going forward through the present day, when you have a film like Black Panther uh, and a director named, uh, like Ryan Coogler getting nominated for an Oscar. And I would argue that the entirety of the 1960s films that really kind of culminated in something like Shaft uh, exploding onto the scene and creating this phenomenon of black exploitation for a period of about three years, um, that 
all the doors that were opened in the 1960s in response to the political developments in this country were really setting the stage for later generations of filmmakers and actresses and actress and actors. Uh, it was setting the stage for people like Robert Townsend in the 1980s and Spike Lee and John Singleton and moving forward to people like Barry Jenkins and films like Moonlight winning the Oscar. Those things, I think, back in the day, were important, significant milestones that have largely been overlooked to, into getting us where we are today. Thank you.